I'm going to ask the obvious question first, John, which is um, how did the project come about for you? At what point did you get involved in the adaptation and how did it, how did it sort of reach your ears? Um, I had read the book for pleasure um, shortly after it was published and um, I was directing a play at the time in New York and shortly after that I found out that there was a film um, in, the, the, in, in development for it and it was with another director. So, yes, can you believe it? Um, anyway, so, so I sort of had to put it on my head and sort of grieve that for a while. And the next I heard um, was a, a phone call from Amanda Posey saying, would you like to read, who's one of the producers along with Fanon Edouard, would you like to read Nick Hornby's screenplay? Um, and it was weird. I mean, it was literally sort of out of the blue. The other director decided they didn't want to do it, and there was another actor sort of circling it. And, um, and that, as they say, was that. I... I read it instantly and went and tried to convince them why I had to make it and, yeah. you know, yeah, um, it was very quick from that point on. Now, as, as I've mentioned to you already, I haven't read all of the book yet. I've, yeah. only, I've only got a small way through it, but um, it, it is obviously, as other adaptations are, it, there are some sort of changes, significant mm. changes to the way that it's structured and, and especially to the ending as well. Mm. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the choices that you made with Nick about that and, and how you sort of worked with the changes that he'd made? Nick's sense of what to do was impeccable, I have to say. I mean, because he seemed, and he talks about it, uh, you know, very um, lightheartedly and said that it, was, it just seemed really clear to him. And whether... It's because he's a novelist as well, but mm. as, and that's mm -hmm. his day job, as it were. Um, there's something about the way, and Cullen was very happy that Nick was adapting it, because I think he sort of felt relaxed. That there was a novelist who sort of would have his back, as it were. Um, but he, I mean, the basic structure of the, of the film is very close to the book, in, in three parts, mm -hmm. basically. Um, but the, he, the, the, the one, well, there's a couple of, 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 of differences. One is that the book finishes with her on the train as she's leaving and escorting at the end and you know, the last line is and then she closed her eyes and thought no more about it and it's 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 a perfectly pitched piece of prose where Colm has sort of walked around her dilemma and her emotional state and and leaves you the viewer reader sorry leaves you with a lot to figure out about what the rest of her life is going to be like but she's going back to America but this sense is she's going back because the scene that's provoked her back i.e. the confrontation scene with Nettles Kelly in the book is a lot more about shaming she doesn't s s say much in that scene it's just somebody going I know your secret and she gets very scared and that sort of provokes her back to going back to America and in this instance the film when you're dramatizing something, you know, you're not wandering around a person's head for 10 pages and something may or may not happen and it can still be completely compelling. This was much more about the story of somebody, uh, a sort of a development of a young woman who at the start has no agency over her own life. I mean, she doesn't decide to go to New York at the start. It's decided for her by her sister and by Father Flood. Going from there right to the end, it felt like that was the thing that needed to be dramatized more and, mm -hmm. and dialed up in order to land emotionally. And... Nick had the rather inspired idea of delivering her back to America and not just seeing her back to America and it's not that it's a, a happy ending or anything of the sort. For me, his great stroke is that scene with the young girl on, on the deck of the ship um, because you see, it's like one of those marker scenes where you see just how far Ailish has come from the young girl who was on the ship going over who didn't know not she wasn't wise enough to, to know not to eat and she met that glamorous woman who was regretting having gone back to Ireland because she clearly had been infuriated by whatever had happened back in Ireland. She sort of has turned into that and there's a consistent number of scenes of the kindness of strangers, as it were, or in particular kindness of older women to younger women, mm -hmm. experienced women mm -hmm. to, to, to less experienced women and occasionally um, meaner women to younger women but mostly kinder. And... Um, and it sort of made sense that for her to pass on that information to somebody else and conclude the film on that tone felt right. And Colm paid him a very high compliment last week at a, at a Q and A, saying, you know, that he felt that he could never do something like that in a novel because it would sort of betray a reader's journey. But that he likes to think that if he was writing a screenplay, he would have smiled at the golden opportunity to deliver her back across the ocean and con conclude the story in that way. Um, and so few people have, have said quite wrongly that we've changed the ending, and it has, it's not, it is the same ending, but the scene that's, that sort of springboards into it is definitely 
much more about her standing up and saying, okay, well, tell my secret. My name is Eilish Fiorello. That doesn't happen in the, in the book. It's, it's more, um, more of a gloves off scene, as it were. And Sersha is absolutely fantastic in that scene and throughout the film. Was she already attached when you had come no. on board or? So when I, when I was, um, when I became attached, no, it, 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 it quite quickly became a blank slate for me to sort of do what I wanted. And she was the, in the very best sense of the word, the obvious choice because, and look, if the film had come my way all those years ago, she'd have been too young to do mm -hmm. it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, she was the exact right age and also she'd proven herself to be an astonishing um, child actress, obviously, from the age of 10 on, and a wonderful young adult actress, but hadn't yet given a performance to show that she's really sort of here to stay as a, as a, as a heavyweight performer. And this was her opportunity. Um, so I went and met her and, and liked her enormously. She loved the book, loved the script. And, but what happened, which I didn't know was about to happen between when we met and when we got to shoot the film, which was almost exactly a year, is she moved away from home. Mm -hmm. And up until that point, of course, she, you know, she'd been on film sets for her whole childhood. And it's a very particular, sort of slightly, almost protected childhood. And her parents, who are amazing, and, and have kept her so grounded, and exactly, she is who she is, Sirsha. There, is no, there is no bullshit there. Um, but she moved away, to, she moved to London, and got a flat, and a boyfriend, and sort of had a little bit of life for a while, and was devastated by how homesick she felt and was what's more with in, in particular what was sort of very useful for her with this was she was very confused about it because she felt and it was something I went through when I was 27 when I moved to London um, that that homesickness is sort of something that happens to people who are forced abroad because of economic deprivation or something in a sense you know I mean I came over here to direct plays I was very happy doing that but my relationship to London shifted radically when it became home and my relationship to Ireland shifted radically because it was no longer home. It was kind of another place. And, you know, so that she was in that space, which is, is which, which Colm articulates so brilliantly in the book, where when you, you leave your homeland and you're not from the country that you're now living in, but nor are you from the place you've come from anymore either, quite. So you're in a sort of double state or you become a third thing, which is an exile. And it's a very subtle but very particular emotional state. Um, and she kept saying to me, does it get better? Does it get better? And I said, yeah, just hang out for a while. You'll be fine. It's about the people that you'll bring into your life. And, the, you know, your definition of home will shift. Um, but consequently, she was very, you know, all of that emotion was very available to her every day on set. And it was, it was a very raw um, experience for her, I think, shooting the film. And there were days when she honestly said to me, I feel like I'm not acting. You know, I mean, can you imagine? And, um, but she wasn't saying that as in, um, God, isn't that amazing? I've just done an amazing performance and I feel I'm not... What she meant was, <laughs> genuinely, what she meant was, are you sure this is okay? She, and genuine, she meant it. She was really scared that she just wasn't doing enough. And I was like, trust me, it's fine. It's, you know, it's, you're doing isn't it. Isn't it just? Isn't I mean, it if we just? don't oh, see all the awards nominations for this performance, I'll be so surprised. Oh, well, yeah, what I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to say whatever about that because that is very sort of important. But I just think that watching what's happening to her is like watching a young actor completely redraw the boundaries on what everybody thought that she was capable of, mm. which is significant. And she's, you know, she's in every scene in the film. She doesn't miss a single emotional beat. And she's also got a lightness to her. She can sort of wear a joke at her expense at times, you know, whether it's the joke about her greasy skin or whatever. She, she has got great comic timing. And I think she's... Yeah, I think it's astonishing. The, it the does gift help that's... when you're playing against Judy Walters and Jim Broadbent, though. I mean, that you could say it helps, or you could say coming, it's, you're up against it. Yeah. But yes, well, yeah, yes, 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 very much. Yeah, um, they don't, an amazing they don't want cast for that. of actors there. Yeah. Um, it's such a beautiful film, um, and you know, we see films of this era. They, you know, that the the costume and the period detail. What kind of reference points did you use to sort of draw upon the looks, and particularly? Um, how did you sort of make decisions to, to sort of make visual changes between Ireland and Brooklyn and the sort of different stages of the film? There's, there's mm. very sort of subtle mm. visual mm -mm -mm. changes throughout. It's quite complicated because there isn't this sort of basic uh, visual scheme to it as such. I mean, I suppose the closest is, the thing that I can say about that is, is that um, we wanted the film to the film language, A, the way it was actually filmed, and, and the colour scheme um, and the feeling of the film to gradually 
loosen up and become almost more classical as it goes on. And it felt to me that um, it, it needed to be almost artless at the start. You know, the door opens and she comes out and it's on her face and you walk down the, the street with her and there's quite a lot of gentle handheld material at the start and it becomes more 50s as, as the film develops, as she develops. And you get the first sort of real proper wide shot when she's on the ship and the colours are, we keep a tight rain on them, and the greens and the browns until America. And, and of course it's 1951 going to 52. It's not the 50s of pop culture yet. It's kind of beginning. Um, but so we were very restrained and, and gradually built up to the sort of apex of it, which is at Coney Island, where you have Bing Crosby singing, singing a little song, you've all the colors, and that's where it, it got looser and looser for us, as it were, in, in, a, in an expressive fashion. Um, and all the references were, there's a lot of photographic reference. Um, uh, I watched a lot of films with the DP, but that was more to do with camera style rather than ever trying to evoke color schemes of other films because I really wanted the um, costumes to not be costumes, to be clothes. Mm -hmm. And that's very tricky. You know, Odile dix Moreau, who did it, such a, an amazing job. You're dealing with characters. When you get to America, you're dealing with characters in that boarding house who are watching a lot of films and who are sort of buying their... Macy's version of Hollywood glamour and it's how to calibrate that was quite tricky and to make it always real just on the right side of real but enough of a sense that actually they were glamorous because that's sort of what is um, seeping into Eilish and you don't quite realize it until she goes back to Ireland and, and, and when she goes back and that scene when she was out of the side of the church in the third section it's kind of like one of the Kennedys going back to Ireland. You know, that there's that, that, that kind of, the pull of that myth of somebody who can leave Ireland, make it an American, come back, is still very strong on the, on the, on the psyche. And you don't really want to notice it until that point. So um, Odile had found massive amounts of fantastic Macy's catalogs, which were basically cheap dresses, but they're beautifully shaped, of course. Mm. And... Um, and all of those young women wear those clothes wonderfully. I mean, they, they um, yeah, they just inhabited them. It's, it must be so tempting um, to sort of have a fashion palette, but one of the things that I love is that she frequently rewears oh, her yes. clothes. Oh, yeah. um, They all do. They're beautifully made, but she's rewearing them, yeah. and it's, so, it's yeah. so real, but it's also very fashionable. No, there was a, there was a, a, a graph that Odile did, and, you know, I mean, we were, we were worried at one point that, that Mrs. Kyo was, was rewearing that one cardigan a bit too much, <laughs> you know, we, and there were conversations about, can you even change the colour of it in post? And, it was, and actually, it's like, no, it's... You know, it's 1951, 50, I mean, she's renting out rooms in that place because she doesn't have money. It's not because she's doing it for charity, you know. Yeah. And so um, that's very important. And, I, and that sometimes gets lost in films. And it gets lost in films, I think, in particular, it can get lost in films about the 50s, where the clothes are so fabulous, you just sort of want to indulge them a bit mm. more. And, but, but they had to be on the right side of real, always. And I have to just say, um, some of the moments where her outfit perfectly matched, the doorway behind her, yeah. and yeah, so yeah. wonderful um, yeah. to have that kind of sort of very subtle colour palette going throughout the, the sort of whole film. It was, you know, it, we, we didn't have much money to make the film, and we were shooting on, on, in three countries. Um, so everything, you have to prepare very carefully, which means a lot of conversation, because you simply don't have the um, leeway to say, well, let's shoot it both ways or let's, do, let's have more and we'll reduce it. You, you have to be very specific about what you're doing. And so between Odile Dix Moreau and um, Francois Seguin, who's an amazing French-Canadian designer, everybody got onto the same page very quickly and it, and it had to be that way, um, while bearing in mind that authenticity was everything. It, it um, you know, it's, I know it's very elegant what we've wound up with. I didn't want it to feel like it was a, f a sort of a film train spotting film, which is can you spot the Douglas Sirk reference? Can you get the Kazan? You know, it, 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 I didn't want it to feel mm -hmm. that way, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet, what I said, why I said it's complicated is because, of course, film culture is so influential on the period that you're dealing with, actually, in terms of the real, the reality of people's lives. So. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, well, not a little bit, a lot, if you like, uh, about um, filming um, in lo on location um, for this period of film, because so much of it is outside, uh, and that must have been very tricky. And did you did you shoot in the actual um, County Wexford mm. in Ireland as well? So that we did. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, when we when we started, 
um, looking at, first of all, in Ireland, um, you know, you often start looking at photographs first before you actually go out and sort of walk the streets. You'll have a first couple of meetings with a bunch of photographs. And um, the, the photographs of Enniscorthy didn't look very nice, right? So, so you said, we're not going there. So um, and we, went to, we went to all the other small villages that looked more photogenic, and you stood in them, and actually it was problematic that they were photogenic because either they had been photographed before or uh, th this thing happens, which you know, I'm sure you, people will, will probably spot, that when you point a camera at Ireland and maybe Scotland is, is true, it can get like eye candy very quickly. You know, it becomes mm. a bit picture postcardy, And I didn't want it to have that feeling at all until the third section of the film where it's a little bit more dreamlike. So in order to, to, to sort of get closer to what it looked like, and you know, we, we went to Enniscorthy after a sort of failed few days to just say, let's stand on the street that Column had had in his head when he wrote the novel, stood on the street and went, well, duh, this works perfectly because it was a long run of those houses. There was a lot of satellite dishes, which we had to sort of ask people, knock on the doors and go, would you mind if we... And, but there's, you know, Colin being a local hero, it suddenly meant the whole town moved, you know, heaven and earth to accommodate us. And of course, everybody wanted to be in the film and be extras. And those that and weren't in it were down behind crush barriers watching from 7 a.m. till midnight, even though there was nothing to look at all day long. They, so it was sort of, so we started shooting there. And it, it um, that was an amazing way to start the film because it sort of felt like, I can't believe we considered doing anything other than that. Because you do something like that and it begins to weave its way into the DNA of a film somehow. You already are on something authentic about it. and. Um, uh, then we went off to Montreal, and I was very nervous about that because, of course, it's a film about two places, and if one isn't as authentic as the other, you are going to sort of punch a hole in something. And um, we could only afford to go to New York for two days, and we did one day on the Brownstone Street because you can't really get those brownstones anywhere else outside of Brooklyn, in fact. You know, and even the ones in Harlem are actually the exact same. So we did a, we did a day there and a day in Coney Island because, obviously, Nothing doubles for Coney Island as well. But that was it. We couldn't do any more. So the rest was in Montreal. And thankfully, Montreal has a lot of fantastic, of those sort of stone-cut buildings from municipal, like the City Hall. There was a, and of course, it's such a religious city. There, was a, there were a couple of great church halls. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going to say backstage at the church, but you know, the, you know, it's been a long while since I've been in church. So whatever the, what are the areas that's, that um, is you know, where Father Flood meets her to look at the test results. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was fantastic, Montreal. It gave us, it, but we had to be very specific, Yannick, about, about the exterior shots, because I never wanted it, obviously, to feel like, oh, that's not really New York. And we screened it a couple of weeks ago at the New York Film Festival, and at a Q&A afterwards, somebody said, how many weeks did you shoot in New York? And I, I went, two days. <laughs> and there was, there was a nice ruffle of surprise. So I think, I think we've passed muster with them. I so. would say. I do. I think it's how countries get made, basically, is the truth. And people forget that. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, uh, you know, when we were making it, I was very aware that it was um, something which had a, had a power. It, it, I never felt I was making a period film about the 50s and that it was sort of frozen in, in aspect in any way, right? And I felt that the, the best way of making something which might have a reach past its own point was to never try and nudge an image towards something contemporary, but to try and get it exactly right. That if you get something very, very specific right to a time and place, you have a shot at it being universal, you know? But in lots of ways, what Cullen was writing, in a way, was almost like the secret history of um, uh, Ireland. I mean, you know, the emigration is maybe the defining fact of, of, of um, of Irish life in the 20th century. I don't know that there would be a household in the country that hasn't got its own version or rela a relationship to its own version of, of that kind of a story of a young man or a woman leaving the shores with little more than a suitcase. Um, and of course, England has a very different relationship to that. It, it, it doesn't, you know, you mentioned all the other European migrations to America. England never quite had that. It's been a place where a lot of people have come to, you know, um, but not necessarily made in the way that America's been made kind of like it's a sort of crucible of, of um, migration. But I think that, I think, I mean, he's not here to speak, but I think that part of what motivated Colm to, to write it is political with a small p, which is that if you 
create something that moves somebody, properly moves them rather than a sort of sentimental way, it moves them about the plight of what it means to leave your homeland and go somewhere else. And, and here's a story with no melodrama in it. Here's a story where somebody who just has to deal with how complicated daily life is and getting on with work and boyfriend and being away from home. And um, then you've done something which humanizes what it all too often becomes regarded as a mass sort of um, wash of people, you know. It's, I think hordes was Cameron's phrase about them. Yeah. Yeah. Swarms, swarms, thank you. Um, the great Yves Boulanger, who uh, yeah, I, I saw um, Dallas Buyers Club and just fell in love with his work. I thought it was so, so wonderful. And it's a very, very different style, obviously, style in every way to this. Um, but, you know, almost going back to the, to the last question, because the, uh, I never saw it as a, as, a, as a sort of period piece. I never wanted the film to feel that, that thing that happens sometimes with period films where you feel like a sort of big red curtain pulls back and it's stately and you're hanging back from it. And it's sort of, um, uh, I don't know, that it's, it's continually reminding you that it's not immediate. It felt like the whole thing needed to be emotional and direct. And so um, as we started work, I mean, my, my instinct was I wanted it to be like the Dardenne brothers, actually, very, very close to her and on, on her face. But the material, of course, kept pulling us towards sort of John Ford, in a way. So it's, it's sort of, if you, if you imagine um, a, a weird hybrid between the Dardenne brothers and John Ford, um, maybe a bit of Coppola and Kazan thrown in somewhere along the way, that's, that was sort of what we used to talk about a lot when we, when we, were, when we were devising the, the visual scheme for it. Um, uh, but he's a remarkably intuitive cameraman, which again is one of those things, you don't know that before you work with somebody. You, you just don't know it until you see him on set photographing a face. But to see his excitement at what would happen in a take after I'd talk to Saoirse and she'd do it one way and take two, three, three, you know, more conversation, watching it develop, was you, you, there's a sort of three-way dance happens, which is really exciting and um, is just the biggest kick you can get on a film set when, when you've got a cameraman who's responding to that and who's sensitive to it and excited by what's happening inside an actor's face. And um, it, it, in lots of ways, it is a film which is all about a face, you know, and I think Saoirse could have been a great silent movie actress. I think she has that kind of face. So, um, uh, and then of course we had to be very clever and he had to help a lot with our wide shots because our wide shots, um, I don't want to use the CG word, but we did have to do a little bit of cutting and pasting because we couldn't afford to do the real thing. And so we had to figure out ways of doing that in a way that was always emotional as well, which never felt like a, a sort of gratuitous CGI throwaway wide shot where you know it's CGI. Yeah, it's a very odd thing to do in a film, isn't it? Is to sort of is to is to spend the first 25, 30 minutes of the film expressing a character's loneliness, and then she meets a guy at a dance, and it it kicks off, and it's all great. And you kind of know, okay, this is I know what film we're watching now, and then and then an hour in, that's parked, and another guy comes along, and you can sometimes feel viewers going, hang on, you're not seriously going to say that this guy is, you know, and you've only got about three scenes, maybe four scenes to, again, thank you, Mr. Hornby, for being that precise with it, to, to get to the same place, if there's going to be a pull between them and if it's going to be any kind of a film where you have some sort of choice and where you don't know which choice she's going to make, it's, it's tricky. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole variety of things that went into that. First of all, casting was absolutely key. And after we cast Saoirse, Donald was the next piece of casting, and he's an actor that I've been fascinated by and I've loved since I, you know I think the first thing I saw him was a Martin McDonough play um, many many years ago uh, and he's given a performance in this which is so subtle and so restrained and so dignified and and it's so other to the sort of alpha American who you know and Emery is giving a performance which is very different to anything he's ever done before I mean you may know him from place beyond the beyond the pines where he's very very scary nasty piece of work indeed and here he's working from joy 
and smiling, which took a while because he's one of those young, slightly methody actors who doesn't trust smiling. And if he's not, <laughs> it's not costing him enough. It doesn't feel like acting. So he took a, it took a bit of time to sort of feel that he wouldn't be a Nancy if he, if he actually fell in love with the girl on screen, you know. Um, so those two um, elements, I was very, very aware of positioning them on either side of Saoirse. And she was very responsive in very different ways to both actors. She adored both of them in very, very different ways. So all of that, that sort of, um, that worked. But, um, you know, the, the pull between the two really does dramatize the thing I was saying early on about exile and about the nature of, not, of being in, in one's place or another. And in the third act in particular, it's like a dream, isn't it? You know, it's, it, there's something about that section. I used to talk to them when we were on set. I used to say it's a bit like um, the, the, uh, the bit in The Wizard of Oz where they go through the poppy field and they all get a bit sleepy. You know, she gets a bit sleepy in that section and it's partly grief and it's partly being home and the pull of home and there's that beach and suddenly she can see the, the, the upside of coming from a small town because she's been in New York, whereas before it was, I've got to get out of this place, you know? And that is part of growing up, is to realize there's nowhere to go, actually. You know, you're out there, you look there, you want to go back there, well, you know, there's nowhere to go. You're just confronted with yourself and, and what you want, what you are going to do, and that's where you are leading her to. Um, which is sort of why, with that big scene with Nettles Kelly, when she comes out of the door, she sort of opens her eyes, and there is a, a feeling of, of something having finally dropped into place in her as a person, which is, I can't do this anymore. You know, I can't live a sort of version of my sister's life. You know, she's doing her sister's job. Her mom is going, you know, there's the big house, Jim. He's a bit of a catch. And there's a dreamy sense in which you kind of think, she's probably thinking to herself, God, this would be lovely, you know. And she may look back on that summer as the big what if, you know. And she'll, but the choice that she makes at the end is a proper adult choice, which is you can't have it all. You can't, there's no such thing as happy ever after. It's not, and, that, and I think that's one of the things that, Nick thankfully didn't have any instinct to change about the book is that the book says it's, things are complicated you know they're very very complicated and romantic destiny isn't quite as the movies have told us it, they, they are you know it's it's um that in choosing to go one way means you're choosing to not have everybody else as it were um so yeah that's that's the sort of does that answer the question a little bit okay <laughs> Um, I could talk only, a lot about it, you see, so it's sort of, you not know. Not only does it answer the question, but it seems like the ideal time for me to do a little tiny plug as well, because obviously this film this evening is sort of the, the start of our BFI love season, um, and I am now going to present <laughs> John with the BFI love compendium, uh, which is edited by our very own James Bell, who I think is in the audience. Yes. <laughs> so, John, this is for you for, to read Thank and um, and hopefully provide inspiration for another romantic film because it is a romantic film, Good. as well as being it's not bad, yeah it? exactly, um, as well as being about the universal story of um, of like loneliness and homesickness and leaving leaving what you know and and starting afresh. Um, it it is essentially a, a wonderful love story, um, and I think there is a happy ending to it, but. Uh, that's me. I'm no, I do. I don't mean to say that it's not happy. <laughs> I, I think it is, but I, I think the point I was just trying to make is that it's a happy ending, but the, but it's cost her a lot. You can't watch that scene with her mother at the end and realize that you know that's probably the last time she's seen her mother, and wh and what happens with Jim when he's reading that letter and there's a sort of collapse in him that you can't think that she's gone. Oh well, that was that. Mm -hmm. It's you know it's cost her, and that's why that scene with the young girl on the ship is very important when she's lost in her sadness, staring off at the country and kind of. You know, and then she there's a moment on her face, and it's a beautiful bit of acting by Saoirse, where you can see she just decides to not be mean, and she turns around and talks to her, and it's I don't know, it's just it's it's really moving because I think it's just passing on very simply um, kindness. There's you know? very real, um, very wonderful, but very real female friendships throughout the yeah, film yeah, as yeah. well. You yeah. know, yeah, very, backstabbing very real, and very touching. wonderful kindness very all bitchy, in one. But very yeah. kind and uh, all of it. It's all in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And funny as well. <laughs> um, I can't let you leave the stage without asking you what your favourite love and romance films yourself and what you'll be coming to see during the season. <laughs> you mentioned know, we, Brief we Encounter. I know we were talking about Brief Encounter and Dr. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen Br Dr. Zhivago for years, and I want to see that one again. Um, oh, God, why did you put me on the spot oh, well. like this? It's terrible. Um, are, are you a romance Manhattan. watcher? Manhattan. 
Manhattan yeah. would be, yeah. No, here's the thing. I would claim not to be remotely, mm -hmm. right? And you mm -hmm. see, but then I would claim, if you, you asked me what this film is about, I would go, this is a really sad story about immigration. <laughs> we go, no, it's so romantic. <laughs> and I would go, no, it's not romantic. I'm sorry, it is. It's so It's romantic. this sort of Emery Cohen thing, which is, no, romance is not for real filmmakers. And I don't know. It's sort of, um, those things... Uh, slip, you get outed when you make a film, don't you? You know what I mean? Your, your instincts get sort of um, dialed up in a way you go, God, that's what, that's what we made? Wow, okay, fine. It's, you know, um, so I wasn't, when we were making it, I wasn't in any way conscious of, of, of it being romantic. It was always about trying to get those scenes to really spark and to get her journey like really specifically right all the way through. But I can see that it has a certain degree of sort of rapture to it at times when she in love, so, you know, anyway, okay, fair enough, you win. That's <laughs> I'm afraid that's all we've got time for now, but please do spread the word, um, tell everyone how much you loved it, and come back to see more in the love season as well. Thank you very much. And buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>